meeting of the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association tonight. Uh, we have an interesting meeting. We have two guest speakers, Zach Powell from the city's planning department, who is going to talk about uh, Albany's draft bicycle and pedestrian master plan, describe what's going on there. And we also have Andrew Needhart from Walkable Albany. And he'll be talking about that group's current initiatives and their advocacy on improving safety, use, and enjoyment of, uh, of all our roads and bicycle pathways for all of us. So that'll be the main substance of the meeting. And we'll usually, we'll have our usual committee officer and uh, other reports. Uh, I do have one announcement to make this evening, a positive one, given that it's the holiday season. Uh, our board has voted to provide uh, two, two grants uh, to uh, community charities, including a $200 donation to St. Vincent's Food Bank and uh, a $200 donation to Steamer Number 10 Theater. Uh, these groups are impacted or are providing great service during the pandemic, so we are happy to do that. Uh, the pandemic has interrupted and changed everything we do, which I think people know at Pine Hills Neighborhood Association. We're very happy to have been holding our meetings online through Zoom uh, since June at least. And our meetings are available anytime on our YouTube channel as, as this one will be. Can you just write it down for me? Um, well, you can go here. Uh, let's stay muted when we're not speaking. Not to the okay. So uh, the other thing uh, I want people to know, as usual, uh, the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association has their meetings every third Thursday of the month. However, we do not hold our meetings in the summer months nor in December, December and we're going to hold to that uh, tradition, although we won't be having our usual uh, December holiday gathering, obviously, given the, the strictures of the pandemic. Uh, but our next meeting will be in January and the third Thursday of January 2021 is the 21st of the month. So that's the next time we'll be back for the meeting. So with that, we are going to start our program unless there are any other announcements from board members. Not seeing any. So we'll start out with Zach Powell, who's a senior planner from Albany's Department of Planning and Development. And he's gonna present the city's draft bicycle and pedestrian master plan describe its process and take input from, uh, from members and board members. More information on the plan is available online and I'm sure he'll tell you about that. Zach, with that, to you. Perfect, thanks so much, John. Um, just to, so I'm not being a time hog, um, how long is the meeting going for? We try to keep to a bit over an hour for the main presentation we're usually allowing a about 40 minutes. So I'd say take at least 15 and then we'll have time for questions and back and forth. But longer perfect. if you absolutely need it. Okay, perfect. I will try and keep the presentation short so that we can get to as many questions and comments as possible. Um, so as John mentioned, uh, my name is Zach Powell. I'm acting as the project manager for the city's bicycle and pedestrian master plan. Um, just gonna go through a quick um, agenda. So I'll just, uh, quickly talk about the project, the vision and goals for the plan, um, show some screenshots of the project website and survey, talk a little bit about the community engagement that we've done, and then the upcoming schedule for the plan, and then get to some of your questions and comments. Um, so this project is an update to the city's 2009 bicycle master plan. Um, so uh, we wanted to update the components of the bicycle plan, master plan to make sure that they're still uh, representative of what people need in the city, but also include a pedestrian component as well, because um, you know, for anyone using any type of transportation, um, they're gonna be a pedestrian for a portion of it. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that this is holistic as possible and making sure that we're identifying um, you know, multiple modes of trans, multiple modes or types of transportation and how they interact um, and making sure that we're addressing the needs of pedestrians throughout the city. Um, and the, the goal of this plan is to identify priority projects and policies that we wanted to see for the city uh, moving forward 
in the immediate and the long-term future. Um, and this grant was funded in part by the city um, as well as the Capital District Transportation Committee. Um, they're our local, or one of our two local metropolitan planning organizations, and they provide technical assistance and funding for transportation related projects in the capital region. Um, so for the vision and goals of the plan, um, we worked with the Citizen Advisory Committee um, as well as our technical advisory committee. And these are made of um, city residents and advocates um, who have experience um, as pedestrians and cyclists uh, to develop a vision um, for the master plan. Um, so starting off uh, that the city is served by walking and cycling networks that are welcoming, intuitive and continuous. That walking, cycling, and public transportation are a fundamental and viable transportation option that supports a sustainable future. That streets feel safe and comfortable for all people that use them. And that there's a culture of awareness and compassion for everyone using the road as they share the road. Um, so to get to that vision, uh, the committees identified um, sets of goals um, to achieve that vision. So um, to do that, the goals for the plan are elevating walking and cycling as a viable transportation option, um, making sure that people who develop policies um, and implement uh, transportation and infrastructure projects, this can be policymakers, law enforcement officials, and roadway designers, are taking responsibility for including um, not only motorists, but pedestrians and cyclists as part of the transportation system. Um, reinforcing the need that there's a shared awareness and responsibility for street safety um, when using the roads. The community members understand the benefits of incorporating walking and cycling in their daily lives. Um, that we can use this master plan to inform um, and seek funding from uh, the state as well as private and public funding sources. Um, and prioritize walking and cycling to create a more resilient transportation network for the city. And then so building from those goals, um, these objectives are kind of the smaller term um, or more uh, granular ways of getting at and achieving the goal of the plan. Um, so what the plan will do is identify a connected and continuous low traffic, low stress bicycle network that connects key destinations and is accessible to all residents and visitors. And similarly do that for pedestrians and making sure that it's getting them to the places that they work, live and play. Prioritizing walking and cycling access to transit because people who use transit often walk and cycle because um, they're using multiple types or modes of transportation. Um, making sure that we're supporting excellent places to walk and um, cycle for recreation. Um, and providing informational campaigns uh, that increase the awareness and benefits of walking and cycling and promoting it as part of an active and sustainable lifestyle. And one of the nice things about um, the master plan um, is that we're gonna be able to continue these efforts um, in supporting safety um, into the coming year because we uh, received additional grant funding um, through uh, Walk America um, as well as um, the Capital District Transportation Committee to do more demonstration projects and outreach um, to continue those goals. Um, and then continuing on with some of the other objectives, um, reducing congestion and vehicle miles traveled by providing inviting walking and cycling facilities, developing and funding cost-effective phased projects over practical time horizons, relative to the administrative resources and capacity, um, and a lot of that is uh, somewhat technical, um, but really that's just making sure that we're identifying um, short-term and long-term projects that we can achieve um, given our constraints for funding, um, staffing, as well as um, you know, the physical constraints of the roads themselves. Um, and then for the last two, um, prioritizing projects that serve populations that'll benefit most from them. Um, this was a really important component of the plan. Um, the mayor and the common council worked over the past year to adopt the equity agenda. Um, and this ensures that any uh, future infrastructure projects are being, um, and funding is being distributed equitably through all wards um, and making sure that the people uh, that use walking and cycling infrastructure, um, you know, are receiving uh, equitable funding for that. 
Um, so that was uh, a really big component in how we drafted the plan and um, the vision for um, who this network is trying to support. So making sure that we're supporting um, people with disabilities, people who may not have access to a car or limited access to a car, um, uh, parents who may be um, walking or cycling with kids, people with disabilities, um, people who um, may be coming from uh, communities of color um, or from other minority groups um, who may not be feeling safe uh, when walking, um, making sure that we're supporting those people um, as we move forward. Um, and additionally, sorry to forget, um, people under the age of um, 16 and over the age of 65. Um, so making sure that uh, transportation um, networks are accessible for seniors as well as um, children and adolescents so that they're able to get to school with more options um, as opposed to just being carpooled by parents. Um, you know, and similarly for seniors, um, not having to only rely on, um, you know, pre-planned uh, destination or uh, transportation options like paratransit or um, the bus or rides from friends um, or family members. Um, and then the final objective is to develop active transportation design guidelines as well. So that'll be a component of the plan. Um, so for anyone who hasn't seen the project website, uh, excuse me, website, I'm gonna uh, show some quick screenshots. Um, this is the main page. Um, that project purpose and the goals and um, objectives I just went through are on the main page um, of the website. So feel free to take a look at that. Um, and if I went through anything uh, too quickly, you can uh, go back through and look at that. Um, so on our webpage, we have the visions, goals, um, the timeline for the plan, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end, um, as well as our wiki map and survey for the project. So um, the survey um, uh, tries to collect information on how often uh, you walk and bike in the city um, and what would make you more likely to walk and bike in the city. And then our wiki map, um, is a really great tool. Uh, we collected so much information over this past year that we actually had to um, get rid of the data because it was slowing down the website so much and restart it up. Um, but it's a great tool that um, basically looks like a Google map um, where you can um, input um, uh, location specific comments. Um, so if you think there should be a road that maybe has a bike lane or uh, you maybe think there should be a sign somewhere where there isn't, um, you can put those comments on the wiki map and our project consultants will be collecting that data. Um, and you can even comment on other people's comments as well um, to say, oh, I agree or oh, I disagree with this or oh, this would be great to add on to that comment. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. It's a really great tool. Um, I'll make sure to put that into the chat um, so that you're able to um, more easily get to that because um, I know it's a long uh, website link. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through our community engagement approach. Um, I'm uh, meeting with you all tonight kind of towards the end of our community engagement for the project. We started um, in January um, and we didn't start um, our meetings with the advisory committees until March. And that's kind of when COVID hit. We were planning to do a lot of in-person um, meetings and meetings out um, on the streets to do demonstration projects, but we had to kind of reorganize um, and rethink how we were doing our outreach. Um, a lot of it is shifted into um, uh, focus groups um, and meetings through Zoom, just like this one. Um, so we did neighborhood um, Zoom meetings um, throughout the city and we um, based it on clusters of neighborhoods, um, as you can see on the map. So Pine Hills is located in um, uh, neighborhood uh, meeting three. Um, so I'm gonna go through uh, comments for those, but we also held um, a focus group specifically for cyclists. Um, so I'm gonna go over those results quickly as well. Um, so for the bicycle user group meeting, um, some of the major themes that we saw uh, were 
uh, that streets with steep inclines and no bicycle facilities were a really big barrier for people getting um, from the eastern and to the western portions of the city. That the conditions of roads, um, and this can come from potholes or cobblestones, um, can make it difficult to um, ride their bike on streets. That the city speed limit should be reduced to make cyclists feel safer in sharing the road with motorists. And that more information and signage on low traffic streets and existing bicycle facilities would help cyclists better understand um, existing routes that may be informal or formal. Um, and then finally, uh, transitions between um, roads with and without bicycle facilities can sometimes create confusions on um, what streets cyclists should safely transition to. You know, some of the cyclists that we've been hearing from are the fearless ones and they'll ride on any types of roads, but there are a lot of people that maybe are um, um, cautiously interested in starting to ride more. Um, so making sure that we're finding ways to guide people to routes that they feel safe on, um, safe riding on based on their um, cycling abilities as well. Um, so for the neighborhood meeting that included um, the Pine Hills area, some of the major themes from there um, included um, people's desire to install um, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure on paper streets. So for anyone who doesn't know what a paper street is, um, it's uh, portions uh, of the city right of way, um, which is basically the city's property um, that look like a street on a map, but haven't been paved. Um, so they're easy opportunities for city owned land to be paved to provide more connections between neighborhoods um, and connections between streets as well. Um, the next major theme was uh, continuing the Hackett Boulevard multi-use path from Sycamore Street to South Manning Boulevard. A lot of people loved the multi-use path on Hackett Boulevard um, and wanted to see this um, continued um, the entire length of Hackett Boulevard as well. And we saw an interest in um, multi-use paths um, in a number of different meetings throughout the city. Um, people wanted to see expanded pedestrian areas so that people can adequately social distance and have enough space to walk with new outdoor cafe areas that have been popping up since a lot of restaurants haven't been able to um, uh, provide uh, seating at full capacity. Um, and just in general, making sure that um, restaurants and areas um, along the sidewalk, there's adequate distance for people to be able to walk, um, whether that uh, be with people who are using assistive devices like wheelchairs um, or canes. Um, so it, it provides uh, kind of opportunities for all different people um, to feel more comfortable and easily move within the streets. Um, people wanted to see more crosswalks um, throughout the city. Um, some of the examples were Manning Boulevard and then someone had mentioned um, Washington Avenue extension as well, which is not in the um, the neighborhood meeting three area, but um, was somewhere that they had traveled to um, on a daily basis. And then uh, finally, improving the maintenance along the shoulders of roads um, to improve the usability um, for cyclists as an informal um, facility. Um, so a lot of times you'll see kind of the solid white lines along the side of the road. Um, often this can be used for um, carts to pull over in emergency situations or for emergency vehicles, but um, in instances where that isn't happening, um, it provides a little bit of protection um, for cyclists to be able to use that um, riding along the streets. Um, so coming into our upcoming schedule, so we held those community meetings that I just talked about in June and July. Um, we did some demonstration projects in September um, where we did um, a uh, curb extensions uh, along uh, Morton Avenue and Eagle Street um, nearby Lincoln Park. And we did some curb extensions and an example of a bicycle boulevard um, at Brevard Street and Melrose um, and continuing um, the entire length of Melrose. Um, so in November, I'm gonna be talking about this a little bit more, we're gonna be releasing our draft plan um, next Tuesday on the project website for people to look at. And then on December 1st, um, we're gonna be having a public workshop via Zoom where we're gonna be going through the um, format um, 
and uh, structure of the plan and talk about um, the methodology of how um, our consultants um, chose the routes that they chose and um, the priority uh, prioritization for routes um, and policies to promote in the short term and the long term. And then finally, um, uh, we're going to have that public workshop um, in December, um, but we're still going to provide time um, for members of the public to send in their comments um, via email, via mail. Um, and you can feel free to call me or email me directly because um, th that's where the comments will be going to. Um, so we'll be collecting comments throughout December um, and then we're going to be um, finalizing the plan in January um, of 2021. Um, yep, and I think uh, the only thing I didn't uh, mention was that the workshop um, is going to be um, on Zoom, but we're going to also be offering it um, on our um, city's public meetings YouTube page as well. Um, so that'll be streamed on that and then it can be viewed on demand after the meeting. And I think with that, um, if there's any questions or comments, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you all for the opportunity of speaking tonight. Thanks so much, Zach. Uh, questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Virginia. Hi. Um, uh, I like the idea of the crossworks, but I think I made a comment on the survey about the ones that are on Manning. There is a crosswalk on Manning, but um, the sign there continually or continuously gotten run over and was never replaced. And basically, I think the city gave up because um, it was a nice idea. I tried to use it. Um, and then the sign just disappeared. And as far as I can tell, there's no longer, except for the stripes, which nobody pays attention to, um, there's no longer really a crosswalk on Manning, which then there used to be. So are there any um, strategies that you guys have in terms of the motorists obeying the actual crosswalk signage? Because another place, as you know, is on New Scotland Avenue, where I almost got run over trying to go through one of those safety crosswalks. And those signs got mashed many times. And the city gave up and took the sign away. And that was the end of that. So uh, crosswalks are a really good idea, but unless they're monitored and then, you know, um, there's any kind of consequence for people not obeying them, I really don't think they're worth re really pursuing. Yeah, and Virginia, just, um, I'm uh, taking notes of this just to make sure I'm getting everything you're saying. Um, what's the cross street at Manning that you're talking about for the, the crosswalk? Uh, uh, I don't know if it's Lancaster. Um, I'm not really. Yes, my husband's saying it's Lancaster. And it was a good spot to have it. And um, it just, nobody ever followed. And there's no sign there, as I said. It was taken away, and that was the end of it. So I'm assuming it was one of those um, small plastic ones that's put in the center of the road that says the state law. Yeah, it's the Built state law. I, I don't know if it was in the center. At one point, it may have been, and then another point, it was like um, sort of installed on the on the side on the green spot. Um, I was told that it was taken away in the winter time because of um, having to plow the streets, which I can understand that. Um, however, as I said, it was never put back. Yeah. And um, I just find in general that people in Albany don't seem to understand what it means even when the sign is there. Because as I said, you know, I tried to walk through a crosswalk one time and, um, you know, the woman pretty much yelled at me for saying, get out of the road, even though the sign was there saying this is a pedestrian crossway. So I never did that again. That was the end of that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really disappointing and it's, you know, frustrating when that's kind of the culture, um, you know, between motorists and pedestrians as well. Um, so, I mean, 
what we're looking at um, is, you know, making sure that, you know, when we're installing infrastructure going forward, that it's the right infrastructure, because, you know, if they're taking it out in the winter, that doesn't make sense, because then that's, you know, reducing, you know, pedestrian safety moving forward. So, you know, I, I think that's a situation where it's, um, you know, when new signage is going up, um, the city having better coordination between departments and really identifying the appropriate type of signage. You know, in that instance, it seems like it's um, something where, you know, there should be signage um, that's, you know, on the, the side of the road that's large enough. Um, it might be something where there's a beacon sign where there's flashing lights as well. Um, you know, where a pedestrian can push a button and the lights go on um, to provide that increased safety. Because um, really, you know, one of those lower signs, there's low visibility for the motorist um, and it's easy to get hit. Um, and again, it's not very good in inclement weather. So that's a situation where, you know, thank you for um, providing that feedback. But I think, you know, for us going forward, that's us making sure that whenever we install something, it's not a waste of money and it's um, really improving, you know, the experience for pedestrians going forward and making sure that it's giving, you know, motorists adequate time to brake and stop and recognize that um, they need to yield to pedestrians. Yeah, I think the cross, the actual light or something like that would be very useful um, because I don't think people, unless they, even with a sign, unless they see a, a light, they're probably not going to stop. That's just my opinion, but well, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Hi, Zach. I had a um, actually question, like kind of two-part question. One um, is, I know that there have been some meetings on the New Scotland Avenue um, upgrades to that, and I mean, just a very brief update if you have any news on that project, and then. If there are any, um, I've been reading little tidbits about the Patroon Creek potential bikeway along along there, and I was just wondering, is that just a real like far out there goal, or is that something that's actually you know, being considered? And so I you know, would like to just hear if there's any news on either of those. Yeah, um, and sorry, I I can't see who's speaking. Um, Oh, sorry. Yeah, Jonathan Duda. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, so I'll start with the Patroon Creek um, one first and then get back to New Scotland. So for Patroon Creek, um, CDTC um, put out a request for funding to implement part of the um, Capital Trails plan um, that they're doing and they identified um, the Patroon Creek um, corridor as one of the primary um, portions of that trail network. Um, so the original plan um, involves a lot, uh, involved a route that um, included a lot of stakeholders, including um, Department of Transportation, um, uh, CSX, which, um, you know, is uh, the railroad. So that's um, uh, Canada Pacific. Um, and uh, National Grid and a few other large um, utility providers um, and some solutions where, you know, there were flyovers, which um, was a really um, bold idea and would be great to see. Um, the only issue with that is, you know, it's a lot of stakeholders um, getting them in the room together. And with CSX, they have a policy where they don't allow um, bicycle paths alongside uh, the railroad track and mm -hmm. that original route had proposed that so um, there were just going to be hurdles you know using that original plan so um, the city is now receiving funding to look at alternative routes um, to achieve that same goal to providing connection between uh, the eastern and the western portions of the city um, you know kind of following along i-90 um, and Patron creek um, but trying to identify ways where um, it's uh, working with stakeholders to find ways where it could actually be implemented um, so it's not just a big plan because, you know, we, 
we want to see a bold vision, but we also want to see it implemented. So it's not disappointing people going forward and it's not, you know, a waste of money. Um, so that's in the stage right now where um, we're looking to uh, um, develop a request for proposals um, for um, consultants. So that'll be coming out within the next year. Um, and then that process will begin to um, identify those alternatives and create um, potential routes moving forward. Um, and then moving back to New Scotland, um, there, were, there was a traffic study that was completed uh, last year. Um, from that traffic study, um, it determined that there was not um, enough room um, at this time to have a bicycle lane um, along New Scotland Avenue. So, um, you know, and we've, we've heard lots of comments from people that they use New Scotland Avenue a lot um, to ride their bike and they want to ride their bike there. Um, so, you know, based on that, as well as the traffic study, we're trying to identify parallel routes. Um, so one of the routes that is um, going to be proposed as a bicycle boulevard. For anyone who doesn't know what a bicycle boulevard is, it's a low stress um, local street um, that uses things such as sharrows, signage, um, traffic diverters to make sure people aren't speeding, um, speed bumps, curb extensions. And curb extensions are just extending the curbs at intersections so people um, are slowing down as they're moving through the intersection and respecting cyclists and pedestrians. Um, so putting a bicycle boulevard along Berkshire Boulevard to provide um, a parallel route so it gives you know the people who are not as comfortable riding um, along with cars an opportunity to use this other route um, but still get um, to the same places as well um, so that's what we're looking into you know and I think there are going to be lots of routes um, and streets where we're not going to be able to do a bicycle lane um, so I think a lot of what you know our plan will need to do is look at um, what types of signage um, should we be putting on those streets to remind people that you know cars need to share the road with cyclists on any road they're interacting with in the city um, and ways to make sure that we're supporting you know healthier interactions between motorists and cyclists because it shouldn't be um, combative it should be you know it should be working together instead of against each other. Mm. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, John. It's, um, um, it's yeah, it's Eric Shadow. I just Hi, had Eric. a, hi. So I, I just had a question or maybe it's more of an observation. So just the, the crosswalks where you're crossing on the, you know, you get the white person to, and you cross the crosswalk and then there's a typically a left turn, left turn lane that the people have to make a choice to stop. Does that, I, I just see that as engineering, you know, you're putting people in the lane and the people driving have to see you and then, you know, and then stop um, or yield. Um, I don't know. Does the city keep any like statistics on pedestrian, you know, accidents and stuff like that? I just see that as putting people in the way of a car uh, and people, you know, especially even when it's darker this time of year, it's a, it's difficult or raining, things like that. Um, I, I would just, you know, that's maybe something, and I can put that comment in the, uh, in your website too, to, to bring that into the, uh, the conversation here. Yeah. So, um, visibility, you know, in all types of weather, all times of the day is a really important thing. Um, we were hearing that a lot, um, even along a uh, Washington Avenue extension where there were a lot of, um, people who work for the Teresian house who work, you know, either early in the morning or late at night. Um, and they walk to the bus, um, at Crossgates Commons and a lot of motorists can't see them as they're moving along and they don't have a sidewalk. Um, you know, so a lot of that is, um, uh, changing, you know, where parking is permitted to make sure that there's, um, enough visual space for, um, motorists to be able to see the crosswalk in time to break and provide the adequate space. Some of that's just looking um, on our end to maybe um, put the stop bar um, a little bit further back um, so that uh, people um, have enough room uh, when crossing the street and don't get in those situations. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of um, intersections in other um, cities as well that have, you know, the light. And I think we have this at um, 
Central Avenue and Everett too, where there's the, the stop on red for the turn lane. And then it um, turns off once the pedestrian signal has gone through. Um, so it's really looking at um, solutions like that that make sense for the intersection um, and implementing those, you know, and a lot of that can be, um, you know, more uh, reflective signage um, or crosswalks. It can be um, looking at different types of traffic lights, um, signage on the side of the road. So there, there's lots of ways to go about that. Um, but it is an issue that we have been hearing about. Um, so thanks for bringing it up and feel free to put it on our website as well. Um, and you know, when we see the draft plan too, if there's something that maybe we're missing in terms of um, policy recommendations or uh, maybe intersections that need improvements, feel free to comment on that as well. Okay. Yeah, it's really this, the, the left turn across the lane where people are walking across the crosswalk. Um, oh, you're talking about left hand turns, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, but even, um, you know, blocking them too. But um, yeah, I guess that would be, and I've experienced that myself either as a driver and also as a pedestrian. Yeah, you're walking across and you're you're in the way of a car and they're make, you know, they have to make that decision to not run you over. Um, and that's, I think that's where, you know, just locking the intersection for, uh, you know, somebody hits the button, they lock the intersection for the walk and then you free it up and you go through a cycle. If somebody hits the button again, I think that, you know, might be, if you want to make a walkable and safe, I think that is something to think about. Yeah, and we've seen some success um, at Lark Street. Um, from what our Division of Traffic Engineering says, it's reduced um, accidents at Lark in Washington, you know, significantly, I think by like, you know, 70 to 90 percent, um, is doing the, the staggered um, pedestrian exclusive signal, um, or excuse me, not pedestrian exclusive, but just the staggered pedestrian um, uh, crossing uh, cycle where they start first so that they get that head start um, to get across the intersection, but then it's also not holding up cars that are turning left. So it's reducing the number of conflicts between those as well. Um, but it's looking at things like that um, to make sure the pedestrians do feel safer and that, um, you know, motorists don't feel like they're, um, you know, in between a rock and a hard place because, you know, there's lots of accidents between cars where, you know, you know, someone like you doing the right thing of waiting until pedestrians get through, but then get rear-ended by someone who's impatient, so. Zach? It's frustrating. Zach, John Clarkson yep. here. Hi, John. So a study has been announced for Washington Park, I believe it's a traffic as well as bicycle pedestrian and safety overall study. There's a long standing tension between the uses of the park as a park and as a bicycle and pedestrian route. And there also has some major vehicle traffic, which tends to be over the uh, expected speed limit there. So your study is gonna be out in draft next week and then getting finalized in January. I'm not sure the uh, timeline for the Washington Park study, but if you know or could fill us in on that and perhaps outline how it might be integrated with the uh, bicycle and pedestrian plan which you're putting together. Yeah, so that's being done um, by the parking authority. Um, and I actually just recently found out about this as well. Um, so, you know, I think um, in general, we're looking at policies that make it easier for people to safely get to parks um, in general and reducing um, accidents within parks um, and making sure that people are easily able to get um, in and around parks. Um, right now we don't have, um, I think as much in the way of comments specifically for Washington Park, um, but I think um, what that traffic study will do is um, we'll identify, you know, what policies um, that we're proposing in the plan will work and what needs to be modified from that. You know, and I think we're, we're trying to look at the, um, plan is something that can be modified in the future based on new issues that are coming up or maybe things that need to be changed so that we're um, implementing policies in a more effective manner. Um, so my understanding is just um, as you were saying how the park is being used um, and how to maybe reduce conflicts 
you know, because it is a primary route for a lot of ambulances that are getting from um, I-90 um, to the hospital as well. Um, it's used by other emergency services as well. Um, but there's also people that speed through. Um, so, and it serves a parking need for a lot of people um, within Center Square as well. So um, that's something I can um, look into, I think, for the press release on that um, to find out a little bit more information on. But um, unfortunately, we're not the, um, the people that are working on it. So I only have limited uh, amount of information on that, unfortunately. Okay, thanks, Zach. It seems like Leah has a question. Hey, I guess I did have my hand up. Um, hi, Zach. Hi. Hey. So um, I probably am someone that at some point commented on Washington Avenue extension. Um, it is a concern, and um, you know, I know I noticed you talked about crosswalks, and I, I noticed you also mentioned that there are no sidewalks, and to me, that's the major problem and I'm wondering if um, the master plan process will include recommendations for this basic infrastructure that um, is needed because as you noted a lot of people who don't own cars work in that corridor. Yeah and thanks for bringing that up again Leah. Um, so I believe um, right now we have it listed as a, um, a shared use path um, in the proposed bike network. Um, it's, it's a little bit confusing, um, but I think when we do the update, just making sure that you know everything that's um, listed as a proposed shared use path will also be listed um, within the proposed pedestrian network. Um, but yeah, that is something we received a lot of comments on and we're gonna be putting into the final plan. Um, there are some, um, restrictions um, in terms of uh, drainage for the road because it's um, serving alongside um, Washington Avenue extension so um, that frontage road um, there's uh, drainage um, that'll be a little bit of an issue um, and it's a fairly narrow road as well um, and it's also something um, we'll need to be working bless you uh, we'll need to be working on uh, with uh, the state DOT um, as well as um, Albany County's um, highway services as well because they um, maintain um, the portion um, along uh, New Carner Road as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely a priority, um, you know, and that's also another area that provides um, good connections to employers, but as well as the Pine Bush as well, because that's, you know, a valuable resource in the city that we want to make sure that it's, you know, easier for people to get to as well, because there's lots of people um, you know, who live near the pine bush, but they don't have, you know, easy access to get to it and they're crossing really wide roads in order to get there. So um, that's come up a lot. And we met with um, uh, some of the residents from the Rap Road Neighborhood Association, as well as the Pine Bush Neighborhood Association um, to talk about that. But yeah, that'll be a component. Thanks, Leah. Oh, and just for everyone's knowledge, I put the, the press release for the um, um, Washington Park area traffic study um, in the chat if they want to look at that a little bit more. That'll have information on the funding and what um, uh, that traffic study will be looking at. Great, okay, I see the link in the chat. Thank you, Zach. Uh, I think we've exhausted the questions and we wanna keep moving, but I, I hope you'll be able to stay with us at least for the Walkable Albany presentation in case there's some useful back and forth. Definitely. So, thank you. So with that, I'm gonna to go to uh, Andrew Needhart and Walkable Albany. Uh, Andrew, you're on. Hey, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> That was a great presentation, and um, you know, glad that we're the years as a group spending so much time talking about these issues, which I think are really important uh, to hear from. You know, we we obviously have a a city government that's really thinking about these issues and putting a lot of effort into thinking about uh, what it means to to be a safe, walkable city. Um, so uh, I just want to 
introduce myself uh, and our group a little bit and then uh, tell you a little bit about some of our um, our projects that we have going on and things that we might have coming up. Um, I am joined by Catherine Dickert, uh, who's on our board, and also I think I saw Stephen Holt is here too. Um, so uh, I just, I was going to talk for a little while and then we could take some questions too. Um, and uh, Catherine, feel free to jump in um, uh, if, you, if I miss anything on a topic. Um, so uh, Walkable Albany is a group that's been around for uh, a couple of years now um, and basically we are advocating for pedestrian safety improvements around the city um, in all kinds of different ways. Uh, we also get a little bit into advocating uh, regarding land use issues um, that we you know want to make sure there are places worth walking to is how I put it to people. Um, so there's sort of two sides of the house there that, that, that I think of it as. Um, the, the main thing that had uh, brought uh, John to reach out to me, I think was uh, Washington Park. Um, you know, we've been seeing uh, a lot of conversation about Washington Park over the past year. Um, I think, I'm trying to remember when it was that I was last uh, with you all. I remember it was really cold, so it might have been last winter, uh, uh, to talk about Washington Park as we were just starting to advocate as an organization for the idea of making safety improvements um, for pedestrians, bicyclists, and uh, anyone who wants to use the park. Um, and, you know, we've sort of had a, a huge success in that, I think, um, now knowing that we have the traffic study moving forward. Um, we're really excited about that and gonna, going to be advocating as it moves forward and trying to be involved in, in seeing where that that takes us um you know i know for for pine hills it's an it's an important park but it's an important park for the whole city and people come from you know even the region uh to to enjoy that park uh, it's getting a new playground sometime in the near future um and it's a playground that currently is really kind of hard to get to from uh, State Street, if you've ever tried, uh, there's not a great crosswalk. Um, I always have a hard time getting there with my, uh, with my kids. Um, so, you know, it's things like that and, um, and, and some of the other things that, you know, have already been talked about tonight in terms of um, crosswalks and, you know, vehicles not stopping in crosswalks, um, you know, and I think Zach did a great job of sort of outlining the, you um, you know, the, the opportunities and also some of the issues that are there for Washington Park. You know, it is uh, it is a way to get to the hospital and that's important and we need to think about that. Um, but it's also a place where, where kids play and, you know, cars drive way too fast. Um, so there's, there's great opportunity, I think, um, to make improvements. There's some low hanging fruit in terms of calming traffic um, and, and making more crosswalks, cutting off, um, possibilities for using the park as just a shortcut rather than as a necessary link between two places. Um, so uh, all that's to say that uh, we are really excited about that. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be advocating on that. Um, you know, if, if anybody's interested in being more involved with that, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how you can, how you can reach out and be part of what, what we're doing. Um, I, I don't know if folks have questions before I go from topic to topic. Um, I'm trying to keep it relatively brief. Um, so maybe I'll just go through um, a few more things and then uh, we can kind of open it up. Uh, the Some of the other big things that we're excited about moving forward is uh, last year we, I shouldn't say we, someone uh, on the Albany subreddit, Reddit's a social media site for those who don't know, um, had organized a group of folks to get out and shovel when it snows, um, realizing that the crosswalks and bus stops are usually pretty blocked in, especially after a big snowstorm we had last year. I think it was in October, November, a couple feet of snow, and um, it was really hard to get around for a few days after, and um, somebody had the idea of let's get out and, and shovel some crosswalks. So a few of us did, and it was, I think, three or four of us, and it was a big success. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is use the structure that we have in Walkable Albany and the network that we have to, uh, to do this again. So we're, we're, we have the Albany Shovel Brigade. Um, we are recruiting for captains and shovelers from 
all different neighborhoods. Uh, we have a few folks signed up in Pine Hills so far. I would love to see more. Um, if you or any of your family members or uh, neighbors are able to help in that in that kind of way, um, it would be great to have your assistance. Um, we're kind of trying to do a decentralized thing where uh, each neighborhood captain identifies the areas that they want to hit. Um, you'd be amazed how quickly you can clear, you know, a pretty long stretch of roadway. And, and it makes such a big difference for people, especially um, elderly folks, especially kids, people with strollers, wheelchairs. Um, you know, I can tell you, I'm, I get pretty frustrated every time it snows and I got to take the stroller to daycare. I just walk in the street and I don't want to do that. But if if there's a foot of snow uh, blocking my path to the sidewalk, and there inevitably is um, for you know a week after it snows, there's no option for people. So um, it's something that we're trying to pitch in and do. We're also trying to advocate to get the city to take a little bit more of an active role on that. But in the meantime, um, we're doing a neighbors helping neighbors kind of thing, trying to uh, get everybody out there to, uh, to use some elbow grease if they're, if they're able to. And if you're not able to, um, you know, I actually already had somebody drop off an extra shovel, um, or if you just have ideas for particular spots and you want to send them our way, we're happy to, to get that kind of help too. Um, just a couple other things that we're thinking about uh, as just a really brief preview. Um, we're, we're talking and thinking about what we've learned from the pandemic in terms of uh, outdoor dining and street closures and what the city has experimented with and what we could do more with that. Um, you know, we think that it's been good to see some little bits of experimentation happening in terms of street use um, and, you know, maybe it's we can think about ways to continue that even after um, hopefully we put this uh, pandemic behind us uh, in the coming year I'll say just to be conservative I hope um, and then you know we're also coming up to elections uh, so we're thinking about ways we can get involved in that um, around the city in terms of advocating for walkability issues and making that an important part of campaigns going forward um, so we could certainly um, use help uh, with any of that if, if folks are interested. We're, um, you know, pushing for a lot of the same issues um, that, you know, Zach had spoken about. You know, I, I saw one of the slides mentioned reducing city speed limit that requires state legislation, I believe, which we've had a little bit of work on. Uh, we have met with some state legislators about that. Um, you know, we'd love to expand that work if we had some more volunteers who are willing to help on that. Um, you know, Zach mentioned the leading pedestrian interval uh, at Lark in Washington. We'd love to see that kind of thing expanded. Um, that's, you know, I think the, the gentleman was discussing when cars are making a left turn, but if, if a pedestrian can establish themselves, you know, in the roadway a few, you know, five seconds before the cars come out, it really is a lot safer. And, um, you know, these are all issues that, you know, we are working on. Um, so uh, I will turn it to Catherine now a little bit um, just to sort of be a pitch for, you know, helping us, helping us if you want to join up. All right. So hi, everybody. I'm Catherine Dickert. Um, I live in the Hudson Park neighborhood, and I have been a member of Walkable Albany for about a year, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, we met at the library at the Washington uh, Branch Library, and we got together to talk about our experiences as pedestrians in Albany, um, as well as brainstorm uh, for some ideas of things that we might be able to improve or things that maybe you saw when you were traveling to another city that might be a good solution here. Um, and just kind of threw out ideas like that. Um, we aren't meeting quite that way anymore, as, as you've all noticed. Um, and so, but we are moving forward. Um, we do have a lot of ideas that kind of came out of those discussions in the past that, that Andrew uh, has, has described to you just now. Um, so we're taking action on some of those ideas. I'm also interested in identifying some new areas to work on, um, you know, things that uh, need improvement, things that you think would make the experience safer and better. Um, so if you'd like to join us, um, if it sounds interesting to you, um, we do have a Facebook page. I think you can just put Walkable Albany into Facebook and, and search that way for us. And that way you can see some of the posts that are on there and see if uh, any of the topics are interesting to you. And if you would like to uh, join up with us, uh, we, you can email us. 
at walkablealbany, that's one word, at gmail.com. And I can type that into the chat box um, for everybody when we get done. Um, you know, we haven't been able to meet since February, uh, but um, we couldn't use this time to develop our ideas. And, and hopefully we will be meeting again soon. Um, and uh, work together to, to make Albany a safer place to, to walk for recreation and um, for commuting and for running your errands and for everything that you do. So um, please check out those resources and uh, we'd love to have you join us. Thanks. Thank you. And we're happy to take questions if anybody has questions or, or comments for us too. Okay, well, if that's fine, and I have to uh, go help a toddler get to bed, it sounds like, so I'm maybe jumping off after this, but that's okay. Thank you, Andrea, uh, or excuse me, Andrew and Catherine and uh, Stephen as well. Uh, we really appreciate you coming in and talking to us. Are we sure there are no questions, everyone? All right. Well, thanks again for coming in, and uh, perhaps we'll see you in a, another few months. I couldn't remember specifically when you were here before. I just remember it was the before time, I guess, if that's it. Yeah, and it, it was cold. I remember I rode my bike and it was like way colder than I expected it. So it was, it must have been in the winter sometime. <laughs> it could have been September. This is Albany after all. That's true. It doesn't narrow it down too much. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for having us. All right, thanks. Uh, so we'll continue on with the agenda. All right. And uh, Officer Joak with Viva had asked to go first, but I'm not sure he's, he's with us. I think he had another meeting. Joe's here. Joe's definitely here. You just need to unmute yourself. I'm here. All right. Well, then we will start with uh, public safety and Officer Joak with Viva. And I, I thank you for taking me out of turn here. Um, Couple, couple of things to note. Um, we, we seem to have an uptick in burglaries as we've had like five of them uh, in the neighborhood in the last 30 days. Um, I don't have the particulars of those burglaries to know like how they gained entrance or anything like that. But obviously we want to get that information out to people. Uh, remember to lock up and do all the things that they need to do. Um, that, that seems like a lot uh, for this time of year. Um, we did have a couple of uh, shots fired incidents that took place in the last 30 days. Um, seems to be there was some sort of dispute between two individuals um, who I believe shot at each other. Um, they were both arrested, uh, both taken into custody, both weapons were found, uh, but it did take place in, at Hamilton in Ontario back on uh, October 19th. Uh, and there was an incident of, a, of uh, somebody getting arrested for possession of a loaded handgun at Hudson and Quail on the 31st. And another than those uh, noted incidents, we, there is a, quite a few uh, car larcenies that have been taking place, but we've noticed that across the board in the city, um, pretty much everywhere that's, that's been happening. Um, as far as other things, uh, today we did another, uh, another walk uh, with codes and DGS as we continue to walk through some of the neighborhoods that, uh, that uh, we, we have continual and ongoing uh, violations take place. And so we, we've, been, uh, we've been trying to, to uh, take care of that and, and get out there and, and kind of get on that so that we can uh, can see if we can get some of this stuff cleaned up by springtime, make it look a little nicer. And at this time, if anybody has any questions. Yeah, I had an incident yesterday where a guy in a red pickup truck pulling a trailer with a uh, pavement roller on it, knocks on my door and says, oh, we're doing a job over on Oneida Street and we've got some leftover blacktop. And I told him to go to hell and then called Center Station because I know that the blacktop plants are not open when it's 32 degrees. 
but they didn't seem to quite understand that, you know, this was a guy scamming people, you know, here, give me a hundred bucks and we'll be back in 20 minutes. Yeah. Or 200 years, depending on which comes later. Right. Oh, yes, sir. Or is there somebody else? I'm just trying to unmute myself. Um, oh. do you, have you heard anything uh, about, uh, we were asked about the tree lighting. Have you heard anything? I haven't heard a thing. I, I'm, nobody has reached out to me as of yet yeah. about doing it. I don't know how that falls into our, you know, whole state's COVID planning. Right, right. Um, I mean, it's, well, it's been in the past, and Virginia can probably speak to this as well. It's the Pine Hills Elementary School, and Karen Phillips sort of is the person. Right, I, ha I haven't heard anything from Karen, and I, I have weekly meetings with the principal at Pine Hills, and I don't know that they're doing much of anything extra. Uh -huh. Uh, at the school right now. And I'll see her tomorrow and I can ask her tomorrow if, if they plan for it um, and get back to you. But as of right now, I have not heard anything from anyone. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, Officer Joe. Uh, and by the way, I'm sorry I missed the code to walk today. I just couldn't make it there. But, uh, Please it it actually there. wasn't too bad today. We did, we hit Yates and uh, Morris Street, so okay. it was it wasn't that there were, actually wasn't a lot of, of uh, things to note over there. But we didn't want to leave anyone out. Well, we appreciate uh, certainly the police and DGS uh, participation in those. It's a it's a very useful program. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night. So we will go now to the. Uh, Committee on University and Community Relations, Luke Rumsey. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Um, certainly the biggest news out of UAlbany um, as of recently since our last meeting is that um, the university has officially gone on pause at this point. Um, the, our COVID numbers have spiked um, and we're now, last I checked, I don't believe the dashboard had updated um, in the last hour, but we were at 223 cases over the last 14 day time period. Um, that's our rolling average. Um, so certainly up from where we were earlier in the semester. Um, as we've been speaking to the Albany County Department of Health um, and the contact trace team, uh, we've determined that the majority of the cases are a direct result of community spread. Um, so they haven't been able to identify any super spreader events or anything along those lines. We were initially wondering whether or not Halloween was a, was a major factor. Um, anecdotally, you know, based off from uh, me being out with the Albany Police Department and our University Police Department on Halloween weekend, it was certainly one of the quietest Halloweens that we've seen off campus. And that was, that was somewhat confirmed by ACDOH and, and the contact trace team as they came back to us and said, no, it's not, you know, necessarily related to any major party or anything along those lines. Um, but we have seen the numbers in the county and throughout the course of the region start to tick up. And it seems as though several of our students have come into contact with other positives that are out there, either restaurants or their jobs, um, et cetera, brought it back to campus. Uh, interestingly enough, the majority of the uptick in cases are actually on-campus students. Um, they're not our off-campus students that are showing that, that surge. Um, that being said, um, the full pause order, really what that means, is that our classes have been transitioned to fully remote. Um, so there is no in-person or hybrid person classes. Um, we're doing takeout meals only, um, no visitors on campus, or at least not, not inside the residence halls. Um, we've removed all of our common area seating. And so the limited seating that we had in the campus center, um, et cetera, that's all gone. Um, and, and all of our buildings for the most part are, are you know under under a good sort of lockdown libraries are remote etc there's no athletics um, and as you know you can imagine many of our students because of the fully remote nature um, you know since the pause order has come through many of our students have already started to go home um, so we had over 4,000 on campus we're down to under three um, I was you know walking around the community here 
uh, a couple days ago um, with some individuals doing some some knocks on doors, talking to them about burglaries and things along those lines. And we found that several of our off-campus students have already started to leave uh, for Thanksgiving break. Um, prior to our students leaving, they do have to test out with us, um, and, and that is with our pool testing program to ensure that they are not positive and that they are clear to go home. Um, and so those tests will be going on through the end of, um, or through, I should say, the early part of next week. Uh, many of our students um, will be testing out early next week to, to go home for the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, we are pushing out burglary information, as, as Officer Aquaviva had alluded to. We've started to see um, an uptick in burglaries in the area. Um, and we know that once our students leave, you know, their apartments are at risk. Um, so we've started doing our door to doors, uh, pushing it out via social media, email and other channels. Um, our spring semester will not start until February 1st. Um, so it's a, it's a abnormally long break for us um, from mid November um, through really early February. Um, the spring semester is going to look very similar to the fall in the sense that the majority of our classes will be online. Um, there will be a smaller portion that will be hybrid and then a very small portion that will be fully in person. Um, it'll also end on May 15th, um, which is around about the same time. So we're starting later, later but we're ending um, right around the same time and there will be no spring break. So we're gonna be going straight through. And that's really about it on my end, John. I don't know if anybody has questions. When are finals? I'm asking as a mom. Sure, that's a good question. Um, so finals, um, the last day of classes is gonna be the 23rd. Um, then we go on a little bit of a hiatus for Thanksgiving. Um, and then the week that they come back, um, they're gonna be in session through December 7th. Um, but all of our finals will be remote. So there will be nothing happening on campus. And that was by design, even before the pause order came through. Um, so the, so through the, December finals 7th, are, the finals start December 7th or end December 7th? They end December 7th and okay. they start the Monday after Thanksgiving. Okay, great. Not sure what that date is, Leah. No problem. I can look, I can find that on a, on a calendar. <laughs> Thank you. November 30th. I mean, I could also look that up on, you know, on the U Albany. Alfredo got calendar, it. November 30th but, but I've got you. Through, through December 7th. All right. Thank There's you. There's nothing wrong with crowdsourcing when you need to, Leah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, let's move on to. Oh, just really quick. Oh, just not fine. It's a woo, so I just wanted to just take, thank Luke, especially for the Halloween uh, weekend and just organizing with law enforcement to kind of patrol the neighborhood and discourage any type of mass gathering uh, or whatnot. I was actually walking around the neighborhood and I did see a heavy police presence. I believe it was probably roughly 15 police officers just walking with Luke or whatever. I was like, Luke, are you in, I was thinking, is Luke in trouble or something? Like, do I have to, but I just want to thank you so much, Luke. Um, really, I think you, you did a lot to uh, stop the spread of COVID-19, particularly in the college neighborhood by taking those actions. Thank you. Yeah, it, it was, thank you, Usu. It was definitely a team effort. And uh, yeah, no, I, I think we caught the students' attention. Um, we did have a, a new pilot. I think I alluded to it in our, in our previous meeting. Um, but, you know, as a result of, of um, you know, the mayor's office reaching out to us and, and you know, um, the assistance with the Albany Police Department um, and University Police, we were able to get some UPD cars out there. Um, we paired up with APD officers and then we had multiple individuals from our Dean of Students office, my colleagues, um, and we, we paired up. So there were quite a few cars in circulation. We did a lot of foot patrols of Hamilton, Hudson, Quail in Ontario, and we started those on Thursday. So Halloween was on Saturday. We were out Thursday night until about four o'clock in the morning, Friday night until about four o'clock in the morning, and then Saturday night. And so by Saturday, they knew, you know, our students knew, the permanent residents knew, everybody in that area, really from Washington over to Myrtle, um, and from Lake up to, you know, Maine, Allen area, they knew. They knew that there was a lot of people out there that were looking, and, and you know, we definitely um, were doing some enforcement. And so, but thankfully, it was, it was a relatively quiet weekend. I think a lot of people um, were respectful of the fact that our numbers were starting to trend up um, as a region. And so, you know, a lot of the individuals that we did see out, they had their masks on. Um, there weren't really any large gatherings that, that we came across, um, which was awesome. And, and it worked out really well. So, team effort. Very good. 
Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to say, Luke, uh, Luke also has mentioned at other meetings that this is uh, going to be a model for St. Patrick's Day because students will be here for St. Patrick's Day, correct? Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, by all accounts, this was successful. Um, you know, the university police officers um, felt that it went well, APD you know, felt that it went well in my office, and we all agreed that it was effective. Um, we, we definitely, um, I, I think, you know, helped curb what could have been a potentially um, bad weekend for us. And so um, the conversation right now is when is this going to come back into play? Are we going to use it for the first couple of weeks of the semester? Or are we just going to use it for St. Patrick's Day? But I think certainly for St. Patrick's Day, you will see us out there in a similar model um, and, and, you know, with some minor tweaks. But I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be here to stay. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's go to zoning and code enforcement. Leah. Yes. So there are no proposed, uh, or there's nothing on the planning board agenda, the, the BZA agenda, nor the historic resources commission agenda within the Pine Hills boundary. I do have an update to an issue that the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association uh, took a position on. Um, folks may remember this was during the period of time when uh, PHNA was actually not meeting, uh, but John did have a letter published in a letter to the editor published um, in the Times Union regarding an ordinance um, that the Common Council had passed um, and the mayor vetoed. And in brief, um, we got involved, in brief, we got involved in the issue. Um, mostly because of the lack of working together between the sponsor and um, the planning board. And, um, and it was a concern. I found the issue and I brought it to the board and the board agreed to take a position against the ordinance. Um, so the ordinance was to amend the USDO and the USDO is the city zoning ordinance. Um, and what the ordinance proposed, trying to pull it up, I have a brief summary of what it proposed. So, um, Originally, the ordinance proposed to remove the ability of the planning board to grant waivers. That was one thing. And the second part was to require the chief building official to enforce all relevant city, county, state, and federal requirements and remove the ability of the chief planning official or chief building official from waiving or altering conditions placed by all relevant city, county, state, and federal entities. Um, so, that was that was the ordinance that we took a position against and the reason that we took a position against it is really because uh during in april during a meeting of the planning board uh when they were reviewing the zoning text this zoning text amendment this ordinance um they had asked that it be tabled and they had asked for the sponsor to work with the planning staff and the planning board to come to a solution. And unfortunately, at that time, the sponsor refused. And um, it didn't make sense. They weren't saying that they were against it. They just wanted something more workable. So anyway, the, <laughs> the bottom line short story is the mayor vetoed it. The council was planning on um, overriding the veto, but uh, council member Hoey decided not to override the veto and instead they did work together. So that's the positive, happy ending. It took a long time, but they did work together and they crafted something that is workable that does achieve the goals of, of the original ordinance um, 
to an extent, it, it really um, adds standards to what was in that original ordinance so that, um, so that it meets the concerns of the sponsor and at the same time can be managed by the city. Um, and so that passed last month after our, at the uh, Common Council meeting that was held after our October meeting. And so that's the update. We did a good job by taking a position and um, helping to bring everyone together to find a workable solution. So that's my update. Thanks. Um, Leah, I actually have a question. Yep. Is there an update on 237 Western? I know that a business owner on Quail had contacted me and I'd reached out to you and he, um, I didn't, I, I, I don't know if you, I, I assume you got back to him, but I was just curious if there's No, I news. actually, I, I apologize. I know you reached out to me and I totally forgot to oh. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> go back to my email, which I think was with Zach, um, but it may oh. not have. <laughs> I had an email with Zach for, from a few months ago and then I was going to follow up with him, though I didn't know if Zach, you're still the planning board person. Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, so okay. I believe the um, the original applicant, I think they have transitioned um, where I believe someone else um, is uh, taking over the proposal um, in terms of the management um, for uh, the survey and the engineering work. Um, as well as um, who will be the owner. Um, so I think I think the original um, one of the original um, applicants is still a part of it, um, but they requested an extension um, as part of the COVID process. But I think they're still working on the engineering um, elements of the project. Um, so it, it's um, there's been an extension that was approved um, by our chief planning official, um, who's essentially our uh, commissioner, Chris Spencer, um, but it's still in the works. Um, I haven't heard, I believe, yeah, last we heard about it was about in April, so it's been a while. Um, so I haven't heard um, in a while. I can try and follow up with um, the applicant to see if there's anything new um, and then respond back to Leah. Yeah, thanks, Zach. That would be that would be good to have at least some idea of where they are in the process and how close we are to them actually doing anything with that. Sounds like yeah. we're pretty far away. Thanks. <laughs> Sounds yeah. to me like we're pretty far away. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. thanks. Thank you, Leah, and, and you were very modest. You did a great job in, in working on this issue, and I want to emphasize what a happy outcome it was uh, because the ultimate uh, legislation set standards, clarified what the planning board could and should and would do, and also perhaps gave uh, the planning board a bit more teeth in making uh, provisions such as the one that was, you know, of concern to the neighbors about burying a, power, burying a power line. But it was nice to see something positive come out of all that because it wasn't, wasn't like Pine Hill started this issue. It was in the, the Times Union several times, and it was nice to see a happy resolution to it. Uh, so, thank you for your report. We're now to you, Carolyn, Midtown Pine Hills Improvement Group. Okay, thanks. Um, so the na next Midtown Pine Hills committee meeting will be on Monday, this coming Monday, November 23rd at 6.30 p.m. If anyone is interested in joining us um, who does not already have a Zoom link, uh, reach out to me at figpinehills at gmail.com, P-H-I-G-P-I-N-E-H-I-L-L-S at gmail.com. Um, that will, uh, we follow the same schedule as the Neighborhood Association, so that will be the last meeting of 2020. Um, so a happy thing to get something done with on 2020. Not that I mind the meetings, but 2020 could be like done now as far as I'm concerned. But <laughs> anyway, um, we are, we just had a meeting yesterday on our trash and litter subcommittee. We are working on um, honing some messages to do some education around um, reducing litter, around how trash is handled and around recycling. 
so we hope to get that finished. We, we do have a December meeting for that subcommittee um, and we hope to start getting messages out um, next year and um, do some, a little bit more focused education for the, um, for the student population, um, but also for other neighbors as well, because it's clearly not just students since there's plenty of um, litter around when most of them aren't here. Uh, our Trees and Streets Subcommittee met with um, some of the, um, some city officials to talk about um, getting more trees in the neighborhood and addressing the issue of blacktop uh, in places it doesn't belong. And thank you to Owusu for uh, setting that up. Uh, and then we will see where, we're, where we are from there. We're still waiting to hear back on a couple of questions around what DGS's plans are uh, uh, around sidewalks and bringing, bringing up blacktop. And, and um, we may also do some uh, trying to identify where we need trees. There are, they are doing a tree um, survey next year, but we would at least like to start um, getting a sense of where we might want trees in Midtown Pine Hills. And then thank you to Leslie Callum who gathered the information for um, our business listing. Um, I know the students are leaving, but our businesses are still struggling. So I'm hoping to have something to share on social media and possibly put on our website that can then be used for our, um, our um, to, to drive interest in our businesses. And Marilyn, if you have a listing, similar listing for Upper Madison um, or Virginia, uh, we should connect about that and we can combine it all and support all of the businesses. So, um, and that's all that I have. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Any questions? I don't see any. Uh, then let's move on to Upper Madison, Virginia. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, well, we recently met and are continuing the work that uh, we're trying to do on the Price Chopper block. Uh, we have, as I mentioned before, some partnerships with Albany Parking Authority, DGS Planning, the Madison Theater. Um, and our goal is to um, really upgrade the price chopper block, um, mainly around the benches, um, to put in more um, versatile and user-friendly seating types of um, furniture. Also, maybe some structures like trellises to create more shade. Um, and to paint the um, price chopper wall, that gray kind of nondescript thing to um, make it more attractive. And um, to that end, we've um, engaged a, a company, a design company local to come up with a plan that we can show the parking authority and DGS, and then hopefully try to get some funding from them for that. But this is gonna take a while, maybe two or three years. Uh, we're also trying to get a meeting. Owusu is supposed to set this up um, with Price Chopper in the planning department to talk about safer access into and across the parking lot for Price Chopper. Uh, we need to replace some trees on the junior's block because of the uh, ash borer is killing numbers of those trees. And um, we're hoping to get some money from APA for some new trees there. And um, we are looking at lighting up APD in terms of the seal on that street. And um, then the usual, you know, planting, summer plantings and seeing what we can do with that in terms of the lack of funds that we have experienced because our major fundraiser was canceled this year. So that's about it. We meet every month and um, you can email Marilyn if you want to know when the meetings are, or me if you want to. That's it. Thanks, Virginia. Welcome. 
treasurer. Eric, if you're. I'm trying here. There you go. Is it okay? Yep. Um, <clears throat> apologize. The um, currently in our we have a Trustco main checking account, and we have um, uh, fifty one hundred and thirty one dollars and forty cents. Eight hundred thirty seven of that is um, was part of the Madison Park grant money that was um, procured quite a while ago now. Uh, we have eight hundred eighty six dollars and seventy six cents in our PayPal, so that ends up with um, forty three hundred and eighty one dollars and sixteen cents. We have a couple of outstanding um, invoices to pay for uh, one for Upper Madison, and then John put out some money for us. So, uh, and then we just made two to um, vote for a couple donations tonight, which I think is appropriate for using our money. So. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Membership, John Hammer. I have a question first. Um, what are our annual expenses? It used to be the, the big ticket item was the newsletter, the printed newsletter, which we don't do anymore. And so I know that we have to pay a, a site hosting fee and that there may be some other software licenses that we that we're paying for. But what else do we spend money on? Um, we, you, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I know we usually spend it on meat much or more, but we didn't have that this year either. Yeah, the big yeah, but that's a relatively minor amount because you managed to go out and hustle two million dollars worth of grants, right? So I think if I remember in the past, we ended up paying $300, $400 or something. And we used to fund the community dinners. We paid something. You got you got money out of Luke, that tightwad. Is he still here? Good, we can talk about him. Uh, so, I mean, okay, so those are expenses. I'm just wondering, uh, you know, we have 166 members right now. Um, most of them are paying members. There are a few gratis members on there. Uh, the past presidents, uh, Joe Aquaviva, a couple of other things. So, you know, in the average, if if we get ten dollars a person for 150 people, that's fifteen hundred dollars a month, and it doesn't look like our expenses add up, uh, can come up to to that uh, that amount. And I'm wondering if we ought not to think about giving away a little more money. And that's that's all I want to say about that. I mean, it's a obviously we're not going to have a discussion of, about that now, but it's just something to uh, that that I would think we should want to think about. And yeah, like I said membership is 166, and um, by the time we meet again, we we'll start our new membership cycle, and we will start goading people to uh, renew. Okay, that's it. Unless there's some questions, I am muting myself because so, I talk too much. So I guess that was a, both a question and your report, sort of. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, the next time we have a board meeting, we'll certainly look at those issues again. You know, a lot of organizations are having this issue this year because many of the programs that they put on simply aren't putting on. So it's, it's, giving us somewhat of a surplus, although we hope it will and should be temporary, you know, as things get back to normal, whenever that happens. Uh, and uh, so it, it's, it's likely in the, in, the, uh, in the direction of being a one-time event, uh, but we will definitely put it on for discussion the next time we're together uh, as a board. Well, I think we've had all the report uh, out from our committees. We, we do have uh, two elected officials here, maybe more, I'll check again. But why don't we start out with uh, Councilman Owusu Anani. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, it was a pleasure to join you. Uh, Today I sent out my newsletter, so I'm not going to go word for word, but I will share some of the highlights of uh, the mayor's budget. Uh, you know, 
looking at a couple of months ago, we were actually looking to lay off uh, city staffers and also asking uh, department has to take pay cut and also elected officials also take pay cuts. Um, and we have, for the most part, avoided any of those scenarios at the moment. Uh, and also with this, with the mayor's 2021 budget, uh, you know, there is no additional layoffs that have been proposed, no re substantial reduction to city services um, in the mayor's budget. Uh, we see that, you know, award-winning programs like the Summer Youth Employment is being funded uh, over the past couple of months when we haven't been able to, uh, you know, we, we haven't been able to provide recreation to some of the kids. We're seeing that our kids are out in the streets uh, doing, uh, you know, not, not something more productive, but just out in the streets. Uh, and also, we like to see that the mayor is listening as it relates to fully funding our summer youth employment. Um, Another thing too is that the administration has made a commitment to uh, streets and sidewalks, uh, $7.5 million uh, commitment inside of the budget this year, which is an increase from last year's uh, budget. Uh, we see our infrastructure is aging and we want to make sure that we continue to invest in our infrastructure, our roads, our sidewalks, our potholes that we see um, in, our, in our city. Um, you know, as, as good as uh, this sound, we're not out of the woods yet. Most of the budget is contingent on, you know, receiving federal dollars, uh, particularly I know the administration have said it several times, looking forward to uh, this um, the incoming administration to uh, bail out states and cities, not essentially bail us out, but help us out in our time of need uh, right now. And I think that uh, it will help move the country forward uh, in our state and also our local municipalities. So it's, Rely more so on our uh, federal government coming through uh, again. And every year, we're also going to need the uh, state aid of $12.5 million. Um, and I know the administration is already working uh, over the past couple of months to make sure that uh, the governor's office uh, come through in supporting our aid request and making sure that we get our fair share. But again, it's also relying on, I know the state is relying on the federal government to also come out and support. Uh, quite frankly, I think this is one of the best budgets that the mayor has had in her administration over the past uh, seven years. I think this is really um, an equitable budget. It looks at uh, all communities and making sure that all communities are getting their fair share and while also providing services uh, to residents, especially in these challenging times that we're in. I will say this, I, and it won't come as a surprise, I've been advocating for uh, some type of municipal internet uh, here in our city. Uh, and I'm going to continue to advocate for that because we see uh, the reports that are coming out, particularly with uh, the pandemic that we and there was a report with the school district that said that 40% of uh, families don't have access to reliable and affordable internet. And I believe that when uh, the private sector fails to act, government must intervene. And I think that it's uh, incumbent upon us as city officials to act and work with federal and state or the private sector to come up with a, a, a reliable internet service, a broadband that bridge the digital divide that exists in the city of Albany. Uh, factor all this in, I voted uh, for this uh, 2020 budget, uh, not because it was a perfect document, but I believe that it's imperfection. It's ultimately, stri with, with this imperfection, we ultimately strive to move the city forward uh, and navigate through the hardships uh, that we're dealing with. Um, so that's on the budget side, and I can't take any questions. But as it relates to the neighborhood, uh, in this budget, we're going to see um, a quarter of a million dollars that is going to be invested in Richfield Park. Uh, this is a park that, quite frankly, over the past couple of years uh, have been neglected. We have seen a decline in Richfield Park, and I'm glad to see that the mayor is making this commitment. And I want to thank all of you for advocating for improvements into Richfield Park. We're going to get new bathrooms. We're going to get a new fence. We're going to get a um, sprinkler system that I'm going to share. I just got the redesign uh, from Parks and Recreation. I'm going to send out an email tomorrow about that. Um, we're going to get state-of-the-art uh, playground equipment in Richfield Park. Uh, there's a whole host of things, and uh, I'm really excited that the administration is making a commitment to fix all parks in the city of Albany, not just the Pine Hills neighborhood, but I'm particularly excited to see that uh, that amount of money being invested in uh, Richfield Park. Uh, 
I also want to say, uh, I remember we were supposed to have a ribbon cutting uh, for the flower shop. Uh, there's new developments, but it's all positive developments that are happening. Uh, quite frankly, uh, the flower shop, Marie, is her business is booming right now. Uh, it's every day there is uh, people crowded outside. Uh, she's making more sales than she projected. So I think that she's going to be looking for a bigger space uh, in the near future. Uh, the good thing is that, you know, I was not going to let her go out of the 10th ward. Uh, so we were able to find her a place uh, in the 10th ward. Uh, she told me I can't disclose the location, but I, uh, I know it's confidential between all of you. But I will say she's not going far. Uh, she's not going far. And we'll be in the 10th ward in a bigger space. Uh, so that's, I'm really excited about that. Um, oh, and then last thing. Yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wuzu. Any questions? Okay. Let's go to, uh, Councilman Alfredo Ballard. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, the biggest, uh, Councilman Anani said the biggest issue we've been dealing with for the last few months has been the budget. Uh, so with the budget being uh, taken care of, uh, there are some positive uh, developments. We did pay off the landfill uh, bond, which gave us a little bit of a cushion of about $5 million, which has allowed us to also create a couple of capital reserve funds, um, which long term will uh, will benefit us. Uh, in the past, we've gone out to bond for uh, you know police vehicles and other annual maintenance expenses that we have. Uh, with this capital reserve fund, we'll be able to actually pay for them with um, uh, active active funds. Uh, you know, out of the operating operating budget. Um, so that's going to save us in the long run. Uh, like Councilman Anani said, that there are some good investments uh, in our city and in, in, in uh, all different parks. Uh, one of the, the, the biggest hiccups that we, we, we are concerned about is the uh, uh, potential revenue uh, not coming in. Um, you know, I do expect us to get to 12 million. Uh, the, the state on it that even if they didn't give us the full amount, they on it the majority of that, uh, even in the 2020 budget. So if they on it in 2020, which was probably a very, the most difficult budget we've had this decade, um, I'm, I'm pretty confident they'll honor it again in 2021. Again, we make it, depending on how the federal government comes in, there may be a reduction in that. Um, the biggest reason why uh, I think council members felt comfortable voting for this budget was because we have increased our fund balance significantly over the last five years. Uh, in 2015, we had a negative fund balance. Uh, in 2020, we have a $14.2 million fund balance. It's we should actually be. You'd want to be uh, roughly about 10% of your budget, which would put us about $18 million. But to at least have that 14.2 at this point puts us in a strong position that if the federal funds don't come in, we do have uh, some savings to be able to get us through this difficult year. Um, but it has been a long process, and uh, you know, uh, you know, it's it's a difficult budget, but I think it's a fair budget uh, to get us through 2021. Any questions? Um, Alfredo, is there a plan to do anything with um, Beverwick Park to do any updates to it at this point, or is that because it doesn't have a playground, it's not on the same uh, radar with the uh, recreation department? It's not on, on the list, but we can get it on the radar. Is this, you know, it's not on the radar until you get it on the radar. So it, ha it has a lot of potential. So just putting it out there. Thanks. I, I will, I will, I will, I'll talk to the commissioner about that. Thank you. Uh, I just have, uh, I just have a question and also a comment. First of all, I'll do the I'll comment first. Uh, John uh, mentioned about us uh, thinking in our next board meeting about uh, 
giving money to various groups or, or at least using our money to help uh, the Pine Hills neighborhood generally. But I would also like us to think about quality of life issues and, and things that we might be able to either pay for or help support or do something in terms of just generally improving uh, you know, the quality of life in Pine Hills. Uh, and then my last uh, question, if, if, if I can, is directed at Owusu. Anything happening with uh, the um, uh, ground floor in the Rise apartment complex? Are there any businesses coming in? Are we going to get a, a decent coffee shop and bakery or something that, uh, something that would be uh, an addition to the neighborhood? Yes, and I remember we had this discussion our last meeting and I reached out to Ryan and uh, uh, quite frankly, he's been on vacation uh, over the past couple of uh, months, uh, but he has expressed that he, um, you know, he is interested in making sure that whatever is placed there is something that the community wants. Um, he's in the same mindset as it relates to having a coffee shop. Uh, you know, I, he, from my understanding, he did reach out and say that uh, there's been potential uh commercial uh commercial businesses that are uh, businesses that are reaching out to him but there's no guarantees yet but if there's any recommendations that we have and i did for them uh the fixed cafe uh but i think at this moment uh the fixed cafe is going through some legal issues um and i don't see uh uh danielle relocate into that location until that legal issue is dealt with uh but I, Ryan understands that we want to support our local businesses and we want to make sure that whatever business goes there is something that the community wants. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Meryl, if I could say, I know Barrero is not here, but uh, I remember I was just speaking to him a couple of days ago and he did request uh, $5,000 from uh, the chairman, uh, Albany County Legislative Chairman of the legislature, Andrew Joyce, for 5K. And I think his intent is to support some type of murals and arts in our neighborhood. So uh, right now, I know the county is going through some uh, budget uh, process right now. And I remember having a conversation as it relates to what our neighborhood would want. And that was something that I told him that the upper uh, Madison neighborhood, so uh, Upper Madison group will be interested in having a mural um, at the Upper Upper Madison neighborhood. So Upper um, uh, Upper Madison. Well, so, so we yeah. would we would be interested in having a neighborhood uh, a mural in Midtown Pine Hills. We just don't have uh, any uh, partnership at the moment with um, the parking authority or really anyone else right now to to do that. So. Um, if yeah. some of that could go to somewhere around here, that would be awesome as well. Thank you. Sounds good. And as long as we're, we're coming up with a wish list, let's talk also about the streetscape and the street trees. Carolyn was talking about the areas that were paved and that would cost some money to unpave. And, and, uh, but with the new, the mayor's new tree program, the city's new tree program, that would be a great thing to look at too, a uh, big issue. And maybe that's something I'll throw out to the board too. We could look to be sponsors for, uh, which the new program allows for. So a lot of things to contemplate in the new year, which is good. So not seeing any other questions. Are we all, I, I just want to uh, wish everyone the best holidays you can have and, and best wishes for a, a happier, I think it's safe to say 2021. 2020 was a rough year. <laughs> and uh, we hope that everyone can have uh, a good uh, holiday season, can celebrate uh, safely and within the constraints that are put upon us by the pandemic. And with that, we will see you in January. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Have a good holiday, everybody. And take care. Thank you. Thank you.